Hey guys, God bless you. Hope that you're doing well. I wanted to just jump into Exodus chapter 13 today. And uh, just kind of wanted to start on verse 1 and go down just a little bit. Basically what I wanted to focus on today was just God's fulfillment uh, of the law through Christ. How everything is established through Him, by Him, for Him. And even when we apply the actual judgment, wrath of God, what's to come, what we see in Revelation, we can apply it to Christ. And when we look at the children of Israel and the law given to Moses, the Ten Commandments, through that, holy unto God, everything that was given, everything that it's based upon, even from the garden, because ultimately what it comes down to is sin. And how we look at it and we look at Christ fulfilling the law, and then just applying it as an aspect to the end time revelation and how we can get an idea as um, not saying that this is how it's going to be just kind of putting it as an idea of the new heavens and the new earth and then when we look at Christ fulfilling the law what it can kind of be based upon and how we can look at everything that's going on today and what they've taken today and how it's altered and changed and look at the mercy, look at the love of Christ, what Christ has done for fill, to fulfill it. How all, all of us have transgressed the law because it's the only, only Christ, only Christ himself. And by the blood of God that can remove sins. So the ultimate sacrifice that removes sins because all of us that transgress the law of God and it just comes down to sin. Because um, that's just what it's why it's altered. That's why when you base everything upon sickness, upon disease, upon death, destruction... That's because of sin. And however we apply it, however we look at it, we look at it based upon the law that was given, what Christ fulfilled because of the condemnation, because the law is good, it's given as a reminder of sin and transgressing uh, God's law and, and sin and what Christ did on the cross at Calvary. But now by his blood, being washed by his blood, is there no condemnation uh, in Christ, for those in Christ, those washed by His blood, and that's just by accepting, uh, by accepting His death and burial and resurrection on the cross, cross at Calvary, and it's amazing. So, the one who fulfilled the law is putting in an aspect. Obviously, is the law is good, basing up upon it. But all of us, you know, born into sin, we need a Savior, right? Obviously, so putting that into the aspect of today. And God's coming ju uh, judgment, God's wrath, how we look at it on the promised uh, New Jerusalem and just kind of get an aspect of uh, what it's based upon. But also what's going on in God's children, uh, we look at it spiritual Babylon and what's to come upon uh, those who uh, distort, twist the gospel, do that to God's children. Ultimately what it comes down to is the... Uh, the spirit of the devil, the Antichrist, which is only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And we can look at that from every aspect. And ultimately, we can look at that just based on the law, based on just free will and what people choose to do. But then we just base it upon Christ. And we base it upon what he did at the cross at Calvary, his blood, it's true salvation. But then it's the same thing from Sodom and Gomorrah. And we go to, obviously, Moses and the children of Israel. But then that spirit of prophecy, God raising up prophets specifically to warn, specifically because of uh, judgment and wrath, is just what we look at at the end times revelation. And uh, just kind of getting an aspect of God's promise, God's promise to Israel and to his children. Because God never changes, it's all just the nature, now that's the true living word of God. We can base it upon um, the justice system, the court and justice systems, and God's wrath. And God's judgment because when we apply it in an uh, aspect of uh, both physical and spiritual because it's just the nature of it's just the nature of God sorry when we look at it as the nature of God and just the true living word the Alpha and the Omega past present and future we can look at it as having the true Holy Spirit now obviously being born again but then promised bodies resurrected bodies and also a new a new heavens new earth promised new new Israel so we can look at it in that sense and it's all by the rebirth by the life of Christ the death burial and resurrection the gospel the good news and uh and we look at it and we can look at uh 
God's judgment, God's coming wrath. We can look at it in that spiritual aspect, that spiritual sense, obviously, just like Revelation. But we can also look at it with that physical aspect. So we can look at it with uh, completely clearing it out, kind of like the blood of Christ. And then also basing it and establishing it upon the actual court and justice systems. Because it's like, obviously, law and order being good. God never changes is what was originally given to them. You put it in an aspect of um, the children of Israel, Babylon, when they tried to, well, they enslaved God's children all by idol worship, all by just the envy, the pride of their heart, their self-righteousness, their, their wicked desires because they're of their father, the devil. So just like Christ's prophecy with the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, because when we put it in aspect of the children of Israel, God's promise, he never changes, but we can put it in Christ because it was Christ, spirit of prophecy, the true living word himself. You put it in the actual physical destruction of the temple, but when he laid his life down at the cross at Calvary. So when we apply the salvation and we apply the gospel, the good news, you have Christ who laid down his actual physical body, but then by the Holy Spirit, the spirit that he gave up, we now are born again we can now have that salvation so when we put it in judgment and we put it in wrath just like end times past present and future you have the temple physical and spiritual by the holy spirit you just put it together and that's what's coming and coming upon the world as we see so it's the depths of the word of god and kind of how we're going to apply it a little bit and i'm just going to kind of go with it but it's by the court and justice systems when we look at everything being holy unto God and just getting into um, the sense of when God told Moses to come to him, you know, because when he stands in his presence, so, you know, take your sandals off because where you stand is holy ground. That aspect of the law being in God's presence, God's glory. Now, when we apply it to Christ giving up the Holy Spirit, Father, Son, Spirit, past, present, future, God never changes. The Alpha and the Omega, uh, uh, Omega sorry, the Alpha and the Omega. <laughs> um, we can put it in that sense to where now it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've been through. It's, it's your body as the true tabernacle of the living God. So when we look at it in a sense of the court and justice systems, we can look at it actual physical buildings, the actual physical sense of just like the physical tabernacle where God dwelt. And now by Christ, by the blood of Christ and Christ giving up his life, we look at it at the actual spiritual sense, but still just by the Holy Spirit in the actual physical body. So you put it together because it doesn't matter what anybody has done. It doesn't matter what they've been through. It doesn't matter at, at all whatsoever. It's the... Uh, wrath that the son took on the cross at Calvary and his blood, the blood of God that literally removed sin, any sin whatsoever. And uh, it, it, it doesn't matter. So when you apply it in that aspect and you apply, you apply it in a sense of sin and the reminder of sin by the law, you can also apply it to God's goodness, God's holiness and what he makes righteous, what he makes good, but also his love and his mercy. So, when you apply it, the physical building, kind of like in a sense of a physical tabernacle, you can apply it with a physical body as well, but by the Holy Spirit. So you just put it together. So God's coming just uh, judgment and wrath never changes, still the same based off of the law. We can apply it kind of in a sense of the new heavens and the new earth. And like I said before, it, it, I'm not saying it's going to be like that, just kind of getting an aspect. Uh, just an idea, what just basing it upon God's glory, God's goodness, and His holiness. What's to come, you just kind of put it together. And when we look at Moses, when God told him to take his sandals off, and then when Christ was on the earth with his disciples, and he said, okay, take your sandals, but don't take anything with you, because where you go, you're going to, you know, you won't need it. It's just to rely on God, because it doesn't matter now. It doesn't matter who you are, both Jew, Gentile, you put it in a spiritual aspect. I'm sorry, this is kind of a lot to take in. So um, I'm trying to just kind of slow it down a little bit and just kind of, you know, not slam it in there. But you just kind of put it together. And when we put it in an aspect of the court and justice systems, and now it doesn't matter by the tabernacle, by 
the actual body and the Holy Spirit, wherever God dwells is holy because he sees his son because of the new birth. So when we put it together and we see revelation and God's coming judgment and God's coming wrath, you can put it in a sense to where when Christ told his disciples, you know, hey, when you see these things begin to happen in Matthew chapter 24, let him who's on the rooftop, you know, don't go back and get anything. Let him who's in the, you know, one is in the field, one will be left, one will be taken. Um, don't, don't take anything. You can apply that to the uh, rapture and when God removes his hand. And that's just the type of Christ, the Holy Spirit, before the tribulation that's to come upon the earth, that, that great tribulation. But also you can apply it in a sense both ways to those who are going to be guilty and, and just applying in the court and justice system aspect because we know what's going to happen. God is going to give them ultimately over to what they want. And it's the same thing time and time again when you apply it to the aspect of, excuse me, Sodom and Gomorrah, the children of Israel with Moses in the wilderness, Elijah and the prophets. However you want to apply it, it's... it's Prophecy, God raising up a prophet for judgment and warning because of the false gods, the false idols, Baal, Moloch, Asheroth, Isis, it doesn't matter. And these false religions that you have today, these new age, um, false pagan religions that all is based upon sorcery and witchcraft is just altered and twisted um, for satanic Luciferian worship, which is goes against the word of God, which is just hidden Jewish teachings that teach that Satan is God, and it's completely false. And you can see that from every aspect and however we apply it. So, um, when you apply it in a sense, and what's coming today, and what's coming, God's judgment, and God's wrath, and he promised that, you know, the Holy Spirit, the church will not see it. The bride of Christ will not go through the tribulation. So he's going to remove the bride of Christ and give them what they want. Exactly what he's, what, from time and time again. You want to trust in them just like Elijah? Go ahead. Trust in them. Now. You know, it, it, it's going to be worse for them, he says, in that day of judgment than even Sodom and Gomorrah. Because of how much you see, because it's been the same time and time and time and time and time and time again. You tell someone, it, 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 you take somebody, well, you take it, you put it in an aspect of the one who's more patient, more loving, more kind. The, the one who created everything that goes beyond anything we could ever possibly imagine. If he's saying that it's going to be worse that day, you look at the patience, you look at the signs, you look at the warning, it's never changes. It's always been a spiritual aspect. And no matter how they look at it, no matter how you go about it, it's always been the same thing. It's been the enemy, the spirit of the devil behind it from the heart at the beginning, putting in the aspect of having the free will, having to have free will because that's true love. God's not going to force himself on you. It's free will. And the enemy knows that. So from the garden all the way from the beginning, that judgment, that wrath is to come. God raising up prophets, no matter where you want to go, no matter how you want to look at it, but also applying in the aspect of God's promise to Israel and the children of Israel. And, and God's coming judgment and wrath upon the world. He removes the church, removes the, uh, removes the bride, excuse me, gives them over to what they want, just like time and time again. Okay, because that's what they want. He's going to give them what they want. They want to serve after him. They want to go after him. Okay, here you go. Like, I, I don't know what they expect and what they want. It's like all of a sudden when that happens, it's like, well, you know what I'm saying? And uh, so you apply it both sense. And he says that we, where you stand is, is holy. So when you apply it in the court and justice systems, when God removes the bride of Christ, those who are left... You apply it in a sense of the court and justice systems and those who are, sorry, I keep saying that, those who are going to be guilty because there's a lot of people who are innocent behind bars today and a lot of people that are going to be guilty. But all ultimately, just we know, we know how it's going to be in that day. It's just going to be, I mean, apocalyptic, obviously, if you apply it clearly. It's the physical and the spiritual realm literally colliding together. And, uh, um, so we can look at it when God, right like at the same time, God's timing is always perfect. When he removes the bride and uh, 
those who will not see the tribulation. Well, those who are left, it's going to be an aspect of the court justice system. And just like Moses, you know, you don't take anything with you. It says leave everything. Take your shoes off. That's a type of the court justice system. Law and order. And uh, it's amazing because it doesn't matter how you look at it, any aspect, it, God never changes whatsoever. You could be behind bars, still holy unto God because it's the tabernacle of the, the uh, Holy Spirit, living word of God, Christ. Blood covers everything, it doesn't matter. But also just how the actual court and ju justice systems are ho supposed to be holy unto God. It's all just the aspect of being holy unto God and recreating new heavens, new earth. And just God's promise. So, yeah, I wanted to just apply it in that aspect and just focus it on when Christ told his disciples, you know, trust in him, trust in him. Ultimately, that's what it is. And when salvation, trials, and tribulations, trust, trust in him. So what can you do? Nothing. It's God that does everything if you trust in him and allow him. So, when he says, take your sandals, leave everything, and just take your sandals, trust in him. So, it doesn't matter. But, when you're putting when you're putting it in that foundation and putting in the aspect of Christ, you put it in a way where it's physical and spiritual. So we put it in a way so where the children of Israel will would understand. And when we have it with no difference now in the body of Christ between Jew and Gentile, he's going to put it in an aspect to where they can't deny it. And he knows the heart, and they know the heart. But you apply the spiritual with the physical. So when we look at Christ and he's teaching uh, speaking to his disciples, who are Jewish, obviously, but we can apply this today. It doesn't matter. It's a symbol to them when they say, when he says, "Go out and preach the gospel, but don't take anything with you," because when you're rem when you're leaving from Christ, when you're removing from Christ, they have their sandals on. And when by that baptism of the Holy Spirit, just like John the Baptist, you know, prepare, make way for, you know, the Lord, the one call, call, crying out in the wilderness. It says his sandals I'm not worthy to tie. The foundation, boom, all by that birth, that new birth, the Holy Spirit, what he had given up. Because it's the foundation, the focus point, the context of everything, Christ and by the new birth and by the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So passing it off in a sense, not passing it off to where it changes, just promised by prophecy because it's all focused about on Christ and the spirit of prophecy, the word of God. John the Baptist, a sentence... You apply in the wilderness, Moses, the children of Israel in the Mo wilderness, that spiritual and that physical aspect, boom, the rock, the foundation, all by his death, burial, and resurrection, the new birth. So you have the sandals I am not worthy to tie. You should be baptizing me. Put it together. And uh, so when we... Uh, Sorry, I kind of thought, forgot where I was going with that. Just, oh yeah, sorry. Apply it in an aspect now. Past, present, future. Father, Son, Spirit. The Alpha and the Omega. He does, it, it doesn't change. And what's promised is physical and spiritual. But now, by what's coming and God's coming judgment and, and wrath and applying it in the court and justice system with the new heavens and new earth, all by the Holy Spirit, it doesn't matter what you've been through. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you choose to do by the blood of Christ. You just put it all together, and you put it all together by judgment, by wrath, but also by by mercy, by uh, forgiveness, by God's love, and that's what it bases upon. That's what it, the focus point is all about. Because when you have the reminder of sin, when you have that death, destruction in the world, and everything going on in the world is because of sin. So it's. Uh, just a remembrance when you have that sin, even in the darkness, even by death, it's all just a, uh, a reminder and a focus point of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, which is um, just salvation, true salvation, the gospel, the good news. So however you look at it, even when you look at it as sin, sin, a reminder of sin, the court and justice systems, it reminds us just how good God is. And it's all by his son and by what he did at the cross at Calvary and being washed by his blood. And the blood that removes sins completely. And the coming, obviously, promised Messiah. How God never changes. And it's the focus point of um, His word, His promise. And how He always comes back to His people. And uh, you look at it in the aspect of that promised land. The new heavens, the new earth, the new Jerusalem. And every single aspect that we see today, that we apply today. So, 
was also gonna go to Isaiah 9-6 if I don't I just if I don't remember because sometimes I just kind of go but uh when you put it in a sense tier two I want a reminder because Isaiah's prophecy and how we uh just apply it we apply the true living word in every aspect today but by his spirit of prophecy when you put it by judgment by wrath and how God never changes is the promise is the coming Messiah it says for unto us a child is born unto us a son is given and the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called wonderful counselor mighty God everlasting father prince of peace so you can see here with Isaiah too being Old Testament speaking directly to God as an Old Testament prophet God never changes so you apply this in a sense to Christ's coming which he 2,000 years ago came fulfilled this prophecy father son past present how the Word of God is living and it's always living it's always moving because it's Christ based upon Christ but then when we apply it in Revelation and we apply it to end times and the coming judgment and coming wrath and how God never changes whatsoever because it's all based upon his son what will it be based upon just like what we see in John 1 1 in the beginning was the word the word was with God and the word was God all things were made by him for him and through him and uh, so by that nature you see when we even apply it here as Isaiah speaking directly to the father the foundation is Christ and Christ fulfilling the law and when we apply it to revelation and end time revelation and what's to come and God's promise, the new Jerusalem, the new heavens and the new earth, what's the focus point, the center point, even from Isaiah in the beginning, his name will be everlasting father. Well, that's by the new birth. So even from Isaiah and from Old Testament and from speaking directly to the father, when you apply in that aspect of prophecy, prophecy and judgment to come, you apply it in the sense 2,000 years ago, speaking about Christ right here when he gave up the ghost, being born of the Holy Spirit and then giving up the ghost all at the cross of Calvary. You have the center point, past, present, father, son, because it's all alpha and omega, the beginning and the end. And then you apply it literally every single today, the living word of God, but also the coming judgment, the coming wrath. And you apply it as the true spirit of prophecy everlasting father by his nature the holy spirit past present future the alpha and the omega the beginning and the end father son spirit all one being all one nature and essence all god three different persons and i'd say, just say this and use this as an ask uh time time again it's just you know here's the holy spirit you're born of the holy spirit you're born of the holy spirit doesn't change that it's the Holy Spirit. It's just broken up. God had to give up his son, put himself into flesh. His nature, his character doesn't change whatsoever. A body was prepared for him because God can't die. Well, in the flesh, he did. God can't bleed in the flesh, he did. So, by that death, burial, and resurrection, by the son, you apply it now by spirit. Past, present, and future. Father, son, spirit. When you apply it here with Isaiah, everlasting father, by that nature, father, son, spirit, doesn't change. It's just the foundation. It's, it's the, in the context, the focus point is always Christ. Always Christ, the true living word. And that's what it's based upon. And even from prophecy given to Isaiah, it doesn't ever change. You can apply it literally at any point in time whatsoever because Christ is the true spirit of prophecy. And it's amazing. So just putting it um, and just kind of in that aspect, that sense, this is of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Amazing. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. And it's amazing. So that's what we see today. And that's why when you apply it in that aspect of both physical and spiritual by the tabernacle of the a living God father son spirit because the death burial and resurrection of Christ the life of Christ the good news the gospel by salvation being brought into God's family being born into a spirit of adoption because God gave his son 
so that we could become sons and daughters. It's all by the nature and the aspect. So when we apply it and put it together, you put it together obviously by judgment and by wrath because it's the spirit of Christ, the spirit of prophecy, the true living word and how God never changes whatsoever. But to get an idea of what what it's going to be and, and just how it'll be established and how it was always been the same from when God gave the commandments to um, Moses. But now you take away the aspect of the actual sin, of death, of destruction, and everything that comes with sin because of the blood of Christ. So this is what we can kind of look, look at and look forward to and just putting it together. And when God removes um, the bride of Christ... Just like what we see in the scriptures, Matthew 24, he says when, if there's one on the rooftop, you know, let one, um, let him not go back and get anything. And let him who's in the field, want to be taken, want to be left. Um, you leave everything. Because it's in that sense of when God removes the bride, you also have it where he's going to give them over to wrath er, and judgment and give them over to what they want to serve, which is the Baals, the Asherahs, what we spoke about, because he gives them what they want. And uh, putting it together, there's so much, the depths of the Word of God, but just kind of getting an idea, kind of focusing on it, but showing just how God never changes, and just kind of putting it together. And even by that wrath, that destruction, the coming judgment, it ultimately just focuses and just shows on the mercy, the love, and uh, the goodness of, of God in Christ and what He did at the cross at Calvary. And uh, it's just amazing. So bear with me. I have some stuff that's like kind of written down. So if I kind of bounce back and forth, bear with me. Um, I wanted to just go over this real quick too in case I forget. Because when you apply it to what we see today, we can see that begin to establish. Because it's the living word. And the government will be upon his shoulders. So you literally apply it in every aspect. Past, present, future. And that's what we see today. So... Just like Moses, take your sandals off because where you stand's holy. Well, don't take anything with you whatsoever. Just applying in the aspect of God's presence. But no matter where you're at, it'd be looked at as being holy unto God because you're the tabernacle of God. But how the court and justice systems, when you go to prison and you go behind bars, you're not going to need shoes. You're not going to need anything whatsoever. So even that's holy. Because, But it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've been through. Those behind bars, that's what I'm saying. It doesn't matter. It's now by the blood of Christ. It's the tabernacle of God. All by the focus point. The true tabernacle of, uh, of God that from the Old Testament. Because God never changes. So just kind of putting it in that aspect. I'm sorry it's a lot kind of all at once. I pray that you would just kind of bear with me. I'm trying to be, trying to be patient, but... I kind of get excited a little bit, you know. So, Revelation 6. I wanted to... Just seeing this, because this is... As a, a, tr a revelation, as just, and being open it and, and being revealing, obviously, but putting it as the seals of God, and just seeing what we put see today. When you put it as revelation being completely different than any other book of the scriptures whatsoever... It's uh because it's a it's a revelation, it's a revealing. Every other book that we have has happened, and then revelation is all obviously future and what we're living right now at this time. So it's different, it's completely different than uh, any other book. And I'm not saying you can take away from the context, take away the, from the focus, because when you apply it to sin, and when you apply it even to Daniel, it's all ancient Babylon. It's all ancient Egypt. It's all the slavery of God's children. And now just applying that spiritual. And that's all by idol worship. Sat uh, Satan. Satanism. Luciferian worship. Uh, worship. Sorry. All the, all the good. All that false stuff. That good stuff that they would call it. You know what I'm saying? But we'll, we'll, we'll show them. Um, the Lord's going to show them ultimately. And because they think that's what they think. They think that they're good. It's all pride. They think that they're, yeah, you know, I don't have to do anything. And it's okay. It's the same thing time and time again, just like Elijah. We'll see how it is. It's the spirit of the living God upon um, those false idols and those whom they serve. But it's by their heart. It's all by the nature of the devil and the one who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So God, okay, we'll see who's good then. You say you're good? All right, awesome. 
putting it kind of in a sense of just Elijah there because God promised that it'll be uh, worse in that day of judgment than for Sodom and Gomorrah because they've known time and time again, time and time again, the more it goes on, the more it goes on, the worse it's going to be. And it's like, okay, fine. You think you're good? You think you're awesome? You want to trust in them? Sweet, let's do it. Then you think you're good? All right. And uh, so when we see revelation and applying it as a revealing, completely different from anything else whatsoever, because it's future, you put it together as both spiritual and physical. So that's why a lot of people kind of have a, a little bit rougher time with it and stay away from it because it's more apocalyptic and more judgment, more wrath and um, what's to come in the future. And it's a reminder of sin and they, um, not taken away from just anybody who's reading the word. It's just, that's the time that we live in. So when people, um, a lot of focus, a, a focus about it is God's judgment and wrath because of sin, but where we're at in revelation. So people like, no, even those on the outside who can't stand it, they, they know about revelation, you know? So, um, with when we apply when we apply it as it's revealing completely different than any other book because it's future we can put it in a sense we can base it upon everything even from Daniel Ezekiel we can put it together just getting an idea but putting it both physical and spiritual because it's all about the new heavens and the new earth but um because of what it is and because that there was no chapters originally and it was just letters and because it being an actual uh revelation and uh sorry i'm trying to put it in a sense to where it it's a thousands of years if you would i mean you have the millennial reign so because you have it from the de uh, from christ at the cross at calvary and even the disciples afterwards from acts all the way to paul but you have that in a sense where it's just a large chunk of time. And because of what it is and because it's a, all about prophecy, it's about future. And it's about a, it's apocalyptic and it's put in a sense to where it's physical and spiritual. It, it can be a little bit harder to understand. So just by asking the Lord wisdom and the more you read it, the more you kind of uh, get into it, the, the more he'll reveal to you. And... Uh, so when you look at it as an aspect and you apply it to the actual context, you can go from like Revelation 1, 2, and just don't go to like Revelation 19 or Revelation 5 and then Revelation 20. But if you can hit it kind of like where it just kind of bounces up and down a little bit, but the context doesn't change, it's just, it's, it's solid, it's firm. You can kind of go from like Revelation 6 to Revelation 9 because it's kind of like it's like everything's happening physically and spiritually. You have to put it in an aspect to where it's kind of like you, you got to look at it happening like simultaneously, but how it's laid out and just the way it is, how Revelation is on its own. So you can kind of we can kind of go from Revelation 6, 7, 8, 9 and kind of even it out a little bit, as long as the context is the same, as long as the focus point always is the same, and as long as we're not ever taking away from what the actual scripture stands for, means, and uh, just kind of work it in a little bit. So when we see Revelation 6, it says, um, these are the seals that the, only the sun can open. I wanted to go right here. Because this is what we're seeing today, the shortage of food, what Christ promised, and uh, what promised in these end times. So we can apply it to what we see today. Um, right here, verse 9, Revelation 6, 9, it says, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. So we could... From time past, physically and spiritually, we apply it today as the court and justice systems. You have physical Babylon and spiritual Babylon. All by the character and nature of the enemy. And that's why there's a lot of good people um, behind bars who are innocent. And a lot of people who are uh, guilty who need to be behind bars. So you just kind of flip it. Um, kind of like Christ flipping the tables in the uh, temple. Physically and spiritually, but what's the focus point? What's the spirit of prophecy? What's the promise coming? Obviously, Christ, Messiah, Savior. 
the living word of God. Um, what they're doing to God's children, sorry. Because it's all based upon the same thing in the garden. Leading God's people away. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Putting God's children into slavery, ancient Egypt, ancient Babylon. Leading God's people away. And then now with the same thing today, spiritually. The stealing, killing, destroying, starving, uh, killing God's children. Uh, putting all together, enslaving God's children. And uh, physically and spiritually. Because it's always been a spiritual war. But it's God's vengeance, God's judgment, God's wrath. So you just kind of put it together. You apply it together. And uh, you have physical Babylon and applying it in that sense in the, in the law and the court and justice systems because it's always been whole. It's originally supposed to be holy, but you have the sin aspect because of the enemy. And then just kind of how we apply it today and what we see going on today and what they've been doing to God's children. How they cry out to the Lord God. How much longer, Lord? How much longer, O oh Lord? He says just a little bit longer and that's here this now and uh those who cry out to on the throne of the lamb and that's what they've been doing from time and time again and uh what we see today and uh it's amazing because that's where you know kind of just putting that where we're at because you can balance we see that this is right here too fifth angel sounded was gonna be here very close so you just kind of even it out but looking at and uh, looking at it at that sense Kind of wanted to go over that real quick just before I forget. So I'm going to start here, but I'm going to um, go into prayer and just ask the Lord to be with me and to just guide us and just so we can glorify him. So I'm sorry I spoke for a lot before actually praying, but I'm actually not, but. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord. Anytime that we can just jump into your scriptures, jump into your word and just preach your word, Lord, there's nothing better. And I just thank you. I thank you so much for who you are. I lift your name up and just ask that you would guide me. Please help me to stay focused, Lord. Please help me to just say anything you want me to say and ultimately just uh, glorify you. And please help me to uh, uh, just stay focused, Lord. I need you. Please help me to have wisdom, Lord. You know, I'm just a, a vessel for you to use, Lord. I love you. I love you so much. And uh, just to ask that we can take this and we can apply this just to our life and what we see today and just trusting in you, giving everything to you, being with you, and, and you showing us that you're with us and that you're always with us and uh, just your love for us. And, and no matter what it is that we go through, no matter what it is that we see by you, by your word and how we apply it, Lord, it's amazing. We, we can trust you. We can call upon you, give it all to you, and, and just glorify you, Lord. That's what it's all about. So I just pray and ask that you would speak to me, Lord. I thank you for your children. I thank you for your family, Lord. They're so amazing. They're so awesome. I love them so much. Thank you for who you are, and just thank you for this opportunity, Father. I love you. I love you so much. Thank you. Thank you for who you are, Lord. I love you in your holy name. Amen. Right on. So just right, starting here, Exodus chapter 13, verse Excuse me, verse 1, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, right, Consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, is mine. Because it's God taking back. When you apply it in a sense of, of God taking back what's his and then giving it to his children, it's all the promise from uh, Israel and to the children of Israel. But what was put upon Christ. So, and Moses said to the people, remember this day in which you went out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by the strength of the hand of the Lord brought you out of this place, no leavened bread shall be eaten. So remember, remember, Christ-like mindset. Remember, even from that time in, God never changes, getting it through to them, trying to, even today, that now by Christ, by who he is, by salvation, by the Holy Spirit, we can have a Christ-like mindset. We can have that faith. We can have that trust and that hope. So it says, for by strength and hand. Okay, sorry, sorry. On this day, you are going out in the month of Abib, in the month, in the month of Abib, and it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, 
uh, which he swore to your fathers to give you a land flowing with milk and honey that you shall keep this service in this month. And it's a promise, the prom, the new Jerusalem, the new heavens, the new earth, but the promised land because it's God's land and God's going to take it, take it because it's his land and he's going to give it to his children and uh, have that new heavens, that new earth, that Jerusalem, because it's a promise, always keeps his promise, always keeps his word. But just like the Canaanites, the Amorites, it doesn't matter, the Asherahs, the Baals, the Molochs, the Ishtars, it doesn't matter. It's all pagan, uh, satanic worship that teaches just hidden Jewish um, esoteric meetings uh, that's just enslaves and kills it's of their father the devil so it's the same thing time and time again it says seven days you shall eat unleavened bread and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord and it's all by Christ the nature of Christ who Christ is fulfilling prophecy fulfilling the the, the lamb that was slain God's nature never changes Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and no leavened bread shall be seen among you, nor shall leaven be seen among you in all your quarters. Now by that, don't even have to worry. It's all just applying in the aspect of everything that you did in a sense of work and, and the sin that comes by that work, and now it's just finished in Christ. And now when you remove that sin and you remove everything that comes uh, from that because of the work of Christ, because of the cross at Calvary, well, there's no no longer everything that, that comes with that anymore. So it, it was a reminder. And when you apply it to the leaven, you can apply it to um, just the true manna, the true bread of life. And, and God constantly, uh, no longer having that reminder of sin, but God constantly being there, constantly feeding his children, all by the bread of life, which is Christ, the true word. And uh, it says, verse 8, and you shall tell your son in that day, saying, This is done because of what the Lord did for me when I came up from Egypt. So even from Revelation, we see ancient Babylon is the spirit behind it. It's the same thing. So when you put it in an aspect of spiritual war, we give it to Christ. It's the same spirit behind it. It shall be as a sign to you and on your hand as a memorial between your eyes that the Lord's law may be in your mouth for with a strong hand, the Lord brought you out of Egypt. And we can apply this, obviously, with your rod and your staff from Joshua and the spear, all by Christ. And it's by the word of, word of God. It's the sword, the spirit of truth, because it's the foundation, Christ. And when we apply it in the law, the Lord's law, foundation, Christ, the one who fulfilled the law. Why slavery, bondage, sin? The one who paid for it all at the cross at Calvary. And establishing it, new heavens, new earth, God's promise. You put it in that sense of spiritual Egypt, spiritual Babylon. And now by Christ and, and um, the promise, the goodness of what's to come. But how it doesn't change. You shall therefore keep this ordinance in the season from year to year. And it shall be when the Lord brings you in the land of uh, the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers, and he gives it to you, that you shall set apart to the Lord all that open the womb, that is, every firstborn that comes from an animal which you have, the male shall be the Lord's. And we can apply this too with the ark, you know, his ark and God, two of every animal. God's promise to save life, and God's promise by his children, and how he always has, his pro uh, always has that promise, always keeps his word. But how is life, the restorer, the redeemer, all by Christ and the blood of Christ, giving his life. So, so it shall be when your son asks you in that time come, saying, What is this? You shall say to him, By strength of hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. It's the same thing. Same thing at the cross of Calvary. And then the same thing of how you apply it with Isaiah 9, 6. As the government will be upon his shoulder. So verse 15, it says, It came to pass when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go, the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of the man, the firstborn of the beast. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all males that open the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. It shall be a sign in your hand as a frontless between your eyes. Um, by the strength of the hand of the Lord brought us out of Egypt. Then it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God did not lead them by way of the land by the Philistines. Although that was near, for God said, lest perhaps people change their mind when they see war and return to Egypt, want to go back into bondage. 
trusting and going off of fear instead of trusting in the Lord who's been there for them the whole time. And that's the same today. They go into fear, and, and but go off the wickedness, go off of pride, but going into bondage, going into slavery, they run away instead of trusting in the Lord. So it says, So God led the people around by the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. And Moses took the bones of uh, Joseph with him, for he had to place his children in Israel under Solomon's oath, saying, God will surely visit you and shall carry up my bones here with you. So what I wanted to go here to and focus, because it's all just a reference of Christ, but how God never changes. And it's his promise. And I was originally going, I wasn't going to go this far. I just kind of get carried away. I was going to just go to verse 9 because I was focusing more on the children of Israel. But I, I just, I, I love it. I love the word of God. But you shall carry out my bones here with you. And it's, it's by that spiritual birth. It's by that rebirth, but by Christ and by what Christ had done for us at the cross at Calvary. And by the death, burial, and resurrection. And when we apply in a sense that God never changes that hope, that peace we can look forward to, well, I mean, it's amazing. So just putting it in that aspect too, keep in their mind reminder as they go in fear instead of by the Holy Spirit. God gave us a spirit of power, not a fear. They go like run back into slavery and into bondage. So let's go to Exodus 3, 5 real quick. Okay, so now Moses was tending the, uh, the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to uh, the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in the midst of the bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look. God called him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off for your feet. Take your sandals off your feet for the place where which you stand is holy ground. So applying it in this physical aspect and, and applying it with Moses being in the presence of the Lord, you have... That father, obviously, well, speaking directly to the Lord, the angel of the Lord Christ, applying it in the pro spirit of prophecy and God speaking to the prophets by Christ, the spirit of prophecy, but directly to the father. You have father, son, spirit, past, present, and future, how everything's based upon Christ. So, when you apply it in taking your sandals off, off your feet, and the baptism, and the baptism, John the Baptist, the prophecy kind of like passing it off this is the sandals i'm not worthy to tie in the wilderness just like the children of israel the one who's to come the one who fulfills the law you apply it in the aspect of now no longer jew no gentile you apply in the blood of christ and no condemnation and no matter where you're at no matter who you are if as long as you have the holy spirit and you're, you have salvation you belong to god and that's it. That's that's the treasure. That's the foundation. That's life and life more abundantly and getting to know him. So you have Father, Son, Spirit. And by death, burial, and resurrection, the Alpha and Omega, who God is, his nature never changes. Everything based upon him he says you can you apply that to the court justice systems and the law. He's, when he gives you all based upon who God is, the nature promise and off of sin and when you apply it by law and you apply it as a reminder of sin and you apply it to the new heavens the new earth and, and new jerusalem and just getting an idea of what it's based upon and what we see in isaiah 9 6 and the government will be upon his shoulder and it will increase for better from that time forward you put it in a sense to where now by the tabernacle of the true and living god christ it doesn't matter who you are it doesn't matter where you're at it's holy. It's holy unto God. But when you have the physical and you have the spiritual and you have the land, it's the blood of the prophets. It's the blood of his children everywhere. So you have physical and spiritual. And it's all based upon the judgment, the wrath of God and, and Christ. 
and, and what Christ did at the cross at Calvary, but what's been given to him. And how the nature, the nature of God never changes whatsoever from Moses, where you stand now, the tabernacle, where God dwelt, even being in the presence. Now by, so you pass, uh, yeah, Father, now by the Son, Christ, baptism, John the Baptist, sandals I'm not worthy to tie, Father, Son, now by the Spirit, no matter who you are, spiritual tabernacle, Spirit unto God. So, tabernacle of God where God dwelt, the foundation where Christ came into the world, into the foundation, the world, and now by the Holy Spirit brought into new birth, past, present, future, Father, Son, Spirit, the Alpha and the Omega, the foundation, the context is always Christ. And um, just like David, King of Israel, your rod and your staff, Moses, staff, you have the true tabernacle, the living God with Moses, the natural branch, and Elijah, the grafted in branch, the rod, but how it's all the foundation, the context of the tree of life, Christ, the true root, the true vine, how God never changes. And it's all spiritual now because of the Son at the cross at Calvary. So, past, present, and future, you just put it together. Physical Babylon, spiritual Babylon, you put it together in the end times. It's because it's all in Christ and it's all by that Holy Spirit. So, when we look at the court and justice systems and we look at building that foundation and, and putting it in the sense of the government on his shoulders, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what you've been even behind or what you've uh, done, even behind bars, it doesn't matter. The blood of Christ covers it all. But now that we look at it in that sense, it's going to be holy unto God because you have the physical and the spiritual. You have the tabernacle, the actual buildings, the new lands, the new Jerusalem, and then the bodies, the, the um, those who belong to Christ. And, t and then until that time comes, until we get there, you can just kind of apply it and apply it to what we see today and even those um, who are behind bars and those who will be behind bars. So, it says, Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. Their taskmasters, excuse me, for I know their sorrows. And it was a heart, but God's promise is children. It's the same thing. They're taskmasters, slaves. Physical, Babylon, Egypt. So we'll see here, and then spiritual, same same thing, all in Christ, all by judgment and wrath, and what's to come. So actually, let's go here real quick, just to the law. Or actually, no, sorry, I just wanted to focus the. Uh, I just wanted to focus on the holy ground, and then let me see here. Um, I wrote down. Let me just. Let's go here real quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to go because we're gonna go to uh, fulfill. Christ fulfilling the law. Let's go here, just real fast. So we see. Honor your father and mother as the Lord God commanded you. Days may be long, that all your days may be long, and that it may be well with you in the land which your God is giving you. And obviously you shall, you know, you shall have no other gods before me shall serve no other gods whatsoever besides me. All in Christ, by love, love the Lord God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not convey your neighbor's wife, and you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. It says, these words the Lord spoke to the assembly. So we can just base this upon the uh, Ten Commandments because it's all just the foundation, but it's the law. And it's what Christ fulfilled. But it's just how God never changes whatsoever. So when you apply it in a sense to the servant, these aren't, you have it where the world looks at it because the world enslaves. These are a servant as today as we would just look at as those who have bosses and those who work when you work today you would be more of a serving 
those who serve. It's all Christ. Christ came to serve, not to be served. True love it shows, it becomes the least, and serves. True servant amongst. So it's a get to. When you apply it in an aspect of the serving, I get to serve Christ. I get to serve him. It's The world will try and twist it and try and put it in an aspect that it's not. Because it's a want to. But they twist it. Go against it. So real quick, let's go to Matthew... 5:17 says Christ says um, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets I did not come to destroy but to fulfill so we see that um, and by the cross of Calvary everything that he did and by his blood and uh, it's amazing let's go to uh, Mark chapter 6 real quick Verse 8. So, yeah. Verse 7, it says, He called the twelve to him and began to send them out two by two, and he gave them power over unclean spirits. And he commanded them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bag, no bread, no copper, and their money belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. So, to rely completely on the Lord God, to trust in him, Time and time again, always been there. Same with the promise with his people, the children of Israel, showing them. But in a sense, and putting in a sense, physical and spiritual, to show them, because they're Jewish. So, showing God's promise, but now in an aspect by the death, burial, and resurrection, by the new Jerusalem, by the spirit, spirit, uh, spiritual Israel, no difference whatsoever. Don't take anything with you whatsoever except a staff. It's just to reference Moses, God's law, but to rely on him, to trust in him. Because they were speaking directly to God right here. Just like Moses was speaking directly to God. Because God never changes. So it's the same thing today and the same thing that, we're, that we see it based upon. It's the staff. It's the rod of God. It's the law of God. The rule of God. To, to trust in him. Because he never changes whatsoever. And just like children here. Just like children, Israel. He's trying to show his children, Jew or Gentile, it doesn't matter, to trust in him no matter what. Take no bag, don't take no bread, no copper, and their money. Why? He's the one that provides. He's the one who proves it time and time again, just like what we see in Matthew 6. Thank you for the bread, daily bread, daily, going to him daily. True spiritual man, a true uh, physical uh, man that comes after that as well. You just apply it spiritual and physical, but what's the foundation first? Christ, spiritual getting to know him, getting to know the Father ultimately by Christ, the only way. So, don't take anything, don't don't trust in anything except what, except Christ, except God, just like what he told Moses and the children of Israel and tried to do the same thing. God never changes the same thing today. Trust in him, trust in him, trust in him. But the sandals, where the sandals is a reference and a reference both physically when you see it because the aspect is still based upon the children of Israel how they would see it, how they would understand, but how it's all just by the gospel, by the good news of Christ of the cross at Calvary. So, when he says, you know, go out there and if they won't accept you, dust it off. It's a foundation of sand on them because Christ is the true rock. They knew exactly what he was talking about. They knew exactly. Because beautiful are the feet that those who preach the gospel. It's the good news. So, if they won't accept you, dust it off. That's a testimony. Just like everything that we see in Isaiah you know, if they won't listen to you, it's fine. You did everything that you were called, commanded to do. That's not against you. That's not on you. As long as you're putting your heart into it, it doesn't matter how it is. It doesn't matter what the world says. It doesn't matter what man does. You trust in the Lord God, and he's going to take care of you. He's the one who never leaves you, never forsakes you. So we commanded them, don't take anything. And that's just like what we see when he says, when these times begin to pass in Matthew chapter 24, right before the tribulation, the great tribulation where he removes the bride of Christ, says, don't take anything with you. You apply that in the actual good news and those who will be taken out. And then you apply it in when he gives them, uh, those who serve other false gods and serve themselves over to what they want ultimately. Because... God never changes, and just like from Moses and the children of Israel, just from the garden, it's the sin behind it. He's There's got to be payment. There's got to be justice. There's got to be wrath because they will not accept the gospel. So he tells his um, disciples here, don't take anything with you. You're going to trust in me. You're, you're going to see, you know, um, 
because you've already seen whatsoever. You're going to trust, but it's a testimony against them as they see it physically because of the sandals. They're going to know because of Moses, but also for you to know as well, to trust in the Lord God, but that they're moving away. See, even though they were standing there and they were standing there with sandals, it was still just an idea and a reference because it doesn't matter now. There's no more condemnation whatsoever. You just apply it in an aspect that it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've been through. It's the tabernacle of the living God. And uh, wherever you're at, because he's with you, it's holy. And you apply that in both physical, spiritual, physical temple, spiritual temple by the body. But so that they would see it and they would see the aspect as as they depart from God, as they depart from the Messiah, they're going to have the sandals on as a reference to their leaving holy. They're leaving the one who's holy because they're going to get it. They're, it's going to be put in an aspect and an aspect for them, the children of Israel, because they're Jewish, but also in the type of those who preach the gospel as a um, reference and a testimony against those who dust the sand off because they won't accept the gospel whatsoever. So that's going to become upon them. It's cleaning off the shoes. It's wiping off the shoes whatsoever. And... Um, it's this because of the sand and it's where Moses stands um, because it's just a reference to children of Israel. God's law and how we apply it today by the court and justice systems. And when he says, you know, don't take anything with you whatsoever, just leave it. And you go and you be with God. If you even have no shoes on, it doesn't matter. But also those who goes to prison, those who will be going to prison by the government upon the Lord's shoulders and because of the sun, just like we see in Isaiah 9, 6, his government will be increased because the government's upon his shoulder. You apply it in that sense, well, now you go into prison, you don't need shoes. You're not going to need anything. So when you go be with the Lord, it doesn't matter if you have shoes on. If you don't have shoes, the, Ho the Holy Spirit is the true tabernacle of the living God. It's been fulfilled in Christ. There's no more condemnation, so just leave it. But now those who are going to go into the court and justice systems... Those who are going to go behind bars, it's kind of like you switch. Well, leave what you have because you're not going to need it whatsoever because where you're going is holy unto God because just like Moses when he was given the law, it's just Christ fulfilled the law. But the court and justice systems, the new heavens, the new earth, what the foundation was based upon, everything they get has just been altered and by the law and in Christ and what's been fulfilled in Christ. So where you go... It doesn't matter who you are, those behind bars and those who are going behind bars. You don't need anything. Leave your shoes off. Don't take it with you. Don't take anything with you because you're not going to need it whatsoever. Because behind bars, if you're saved, you're holy unto God. And uh, even the court and justice systems, the physical buildings, those are holy unto God. Because those are God's and that's what it's been all been based upon. So you're removing that sin, you're washing out that sin, and you're getting rid of it by the blood of Christ. So we see that promise to here. Let's go. Um, let's go to Matthew 24 real quick, just to see. I just want to go over it real quick. Let him who is on the housetop not go down or take anything to his out of his house. So just kind of applying that to what we've been actually reading in Matthew 24, when you see these things begin to happen, this is where we're at. So when that rapture happens, when God removes the bride out, well, those who have been left, those who want to give in to the false idols, those who want to serve after their self, self-righteous ways, go after the spirit of the world, spirit of the enemy, well, you apply in an aspect, just leave what you got, you're going to, you're going to go be with the Lord, Totally under the Lord, even if that means shoes, no shoes, but also those who are going to go into, uh, those who are going to be, um, I'm trying to like put it in a, a way, just put behind bars, blown behind, uh, be, uh, those who have to go, uh, face God's judge, face God's judgment and face God's wrath, but also the, the court and justice systems, the prisons. Uh, because you're not going to need shoes whatsoever. You're not going to need anything. So one will be left, one will be taken. Those who are left, you can be put you know, behind bars. One will be taken. It doesn't matter. It's all based upon now uh, Christ, the coming, uh, uh, just the, the new heavens and the new earth and the promised new Jerusalem and God's promise to his children. So I wanted, that's what I was basing everything upon. 
So, I thought that was awesome. That's just what I wanted to uh, focus on today. Oh, whoops. My bad. It's Peter that said it. But right here. It's Peter. Jewish, obviously. It's been a little bit longer. I mean, none of us are righteous. All of us, there are way other people that take longer and longer and longer to get it than Peter. I mean, a lot of people wouldn't have been able to do what Peter did. That's why God chose Peter. But I'm not saying he doesn't choose favorites. I'm not taking away from trials and tribulations. You just apply Peter in that aspect. So, um, right here, verse 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, that's what it is. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of sins you shall receive the gift of the holy spirit so in the name because it's everything that he did it's the finished work of christ on the cross at calvary by his blood when you repent and you accept in the heart repent in the heart trusting in god trusting upon him his finished work for the remission of sins completely you receive the gift gift of salvation salvation is a gift it's been bought and paid for it can't be earned it can't be bought that would be adding to the cross at Calvary that would be adding to what Christ did and saying that it's not enough but it's a gift you have to apply it as gift because life is a gift you just have to look at it as the altered sin and all of us being born in through Adam being born into sin applying it the needed Messiah and the bloodshed at the cross at Calvary well by repenting in the heart believing true faith for the remission of sins you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit so salvation is a gift Getting to walk with Christ as a gift. Excuse me, sorry. Life and life more abundantly. But the gift of the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the aider, the guider, him. Getting to know him, our high priest. It's amazing. It's amazing. So, Heavenly Father, I thank you so much, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your wonderful, awesome, amazing word. And uh, it's just amazing. It's amazing how you speak to us, how you speak uh, through your word. And we can apply it to our life and what we see today. And I just lift your name up and I thank you so much for just allowing me to just speak, um, speak your word and just apply it. Today is a lot and uh, I'm still kind of trying to uh, even it out a little bit, Lord, because I, I just know how you work. And even though it wasn't super intense today, it was still a lot to take. And it's, it's, it's amazing because it's always intense. It's just not, even though because it wasn't a lot of shouting and a lot of screaming today, you know that that's what I like and that's what uh, it usually is. It doesn't matter because the intensity, the, the, the weightiness of the word and who you are, Lord, it just hits and it always hits and it always applies and how we can apply it to our life and, and, and what we're going through. And I just thank you that however it is and however we go about it, just being able to speak your word, teach your word, preach your word, no matter what it is, Lord, it always delivers because it's you. It's you are the true living word. And I thank you so much because only you can speak to the heart. Only you that has that purpose, has the value, has the meaning when we look at it in life. And I just love you so much. And I thank you so much for continuing to show us that, especially when we don't deserve it. And uh, just proving your goodness, proving your holiness and your love for us, even though we don't deserve it. And I thank you. I thank you so much that we can look at these things, trust in you and be together because nothing will separate us in you. It's your promise because you reign, reign, you are king, king of kings, Lord of lords. It's your glory. And uh, it's amazing. I thank you for allowing us to see this, allowing us to be with you a part of this and to trust in you. And uh, I just love you so much. And I thank you for your children. I thank you for your word. I, I pray and ask that you would help us, Holy Spirit, to just take this, take what it is that you want, please, and just apply it and apply it just by trusting in you, believing with you and being with you and, and just knowing that we're going to be with you and uh, that we are with you. But be out here soon because of your timing and just what we see and where we're living today but that your children your family would remember that and see that and i just thank you so much thank you for your bloodshed thank you for who you are thank you for just everything that you've done and what you continue to do lord i lift your name up i glorify you lord you're so amazing you are everything lord i love you in your holy name amen
right on guys so i'm gonna go probably grab something to eat and just crash get to bed and uh you know i'll be seeing you soon all right god bless you